Can you hear any noise behind? Oh, my, no, okay, good. Welcome, bienvenidos, welcome, settle down. Por favor, bienvenidos, busquen su botón de traducción. Estás en inglés, Nick. Eh, ponte en español, Nick, esto. Por favor, los hispanohablantes, busquen su botón de traducción. Mm. Mm. You know what, uh, Enrique, I can hear Nick's interpretation. Tonight. Yes, he, he will talk in English after I talk in Spanish. That's oh, okay. just, for, just in case, so people don't lose what I'm saying. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Bienvenue, welcome, bienvenidos. Make sure you have your interpretation button. El botón de, de interpretación. Si está en un, en un móvil o en una tablet, no podrá tener el botón de interpretación solo en un ordenador. Está junto a preguntas y respuestas. Hay una forma del mundo o donde hay tres puntitos en el menú inferior de la pantalla. Y ahí sale una bola del mundo y escoja español o inglés. Hi. Um, make sure you choose your language. I will speak in English and Spanish alter alternatively, but make sure you're hearing properly. Okay, great. And if you have any questions, you can write to me on the chat or in the, key, in the questions and answers panel. You can send your questions here. So we have a hundred people have entered just now. And we wait a little more. Vamos a esperar un poquito más a que vengan más personas. Aquí quiero aprovechar para dar la bienvenida. I want to welcome everybody from España. Welcome from Spain, Estados Unidos, United States, Sudáfrica, Mexico, Argentina, United Kingdom, Bolivia. Chile, Canada, Peru, Uruguay, New Zealand, Ireland, Brazil, Australia, Portugal, Romania, Malta, India, Italy, Israel, Colombia, Egypt, Guatemala, Greece, the Netherlands, Bulgaria, Sweden, Lithuania, Taiwan, Germany, Swaziland in Africa, Switzerland, Denmark, Finland, Austria, Puerto Rico, Ecuador, El Salvador, and Botswana. Welcome everybody. So let's start our, our webinar today with Daniel Hill and I wanna just appreciate the chance we have to speak with Dr. Daniel Hill today. Welcome, Daniel, how are you? Fine, thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Are you in New York City right now? I'm in New York City, yes. And how, how, how are, it's how's life? Sunny day. It's a beautiful sunny day, yes, oh, wait, great. So we're here together to, to talk about affect regulation theory with everybody who's joined us for this free online call. And I wanted to, to ask you um, why you came to the, to the conclusion that everything bo boils down to affect. <laughs> um, well, uh, I actually, actually I, I don't know that I came to that conclusion. Um, I or, became, or your observation. Yeah, I became uh, convinced of it. Um, after reading um, about affect regulation. And um, uh, it made sense to me uh, that at the bottom of it all, sort of at the bottom of the mind uh, was affect. Um, and it, it, it had actually been a, uh, uh, 
a search that I've been on, you know, sort of what, it, what, it, what is primary, uh, what does it all boil down to? And um, um, that um, uh, came out of my psychoanalytic training. I had ex been exposed to a lot of different schools of thought. Uh, and I realized that um, drive theory said it all came down to drives and then ego psychology said it all came down to the ego and self psychology said it all came down to the self. Um, and um, uh, object relations said it all came down to the object and the relationship to the object. Relational uh, psychoanalysis said it all came down to sort of inner subjectivity. Um, and uh, I realized that um, uh, if you look at it from the point of view of affect, you can explain all of those things, but none of those things can explain affect. And uh, so just on a theoretical level, it was very clear to me that uh, uh, that at the bottom of it all is affect, that it all comes down to affect, if you will. Um, and then it just uh, uh, also fit in with other uh, understandings I had that the mind grows out of the body and affect is essentially the, uh, the experience of the body. Um, and so everything in the mind really comes out of the body is the way I understand. And it's the way Freud understood it. And it's the way Piaget and many, many, many others understand it. But uh, in any case, um, once, I, once I began to realize what affect was too, um, uh, that also changed my mind. That also was a big convincer. I, I, in spite of the fact that um, uh, I was in the business of helping people with their emotional problems, I'd actually never had a course on emotion. And um, so that was another fact. It was just, you know, I, I, I learned something and it, uh, it changed everything. So anyway, yes. very long answer to a short question. No, it's, it's, yeah, it's very, very good and very broad because I think uh, we need to address over and over again why regulating emotions, why regulating affect is so central to modern day psychotherapy. Yeah, yeah. I, I, actually, Alan Shore uh, um, uh, said something that's true. This is that, that th there's nothing more important for the survival of the organism than uh, for it to remain in regulated states. And it turns out that every single life science from molecular biology up through the social sciences that are looking at crowds and you know, populations um, all subscribe to the same notion, which is that in order for this organism to be healthy, it must be in regulated states in order for it to function adaptively and optimally. Uh, it can only do that when it's in regulated states. As soon as we become dysregulated, um, our mind goes south, our body goes south, our relationships with other people go south. So um, anyway. I think this is what we see in our clinical practices, people who have lost the wheel of, of their own regulation and don't know how to get it back in a way, right? Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, uh, probably for most of us, if I had a somewhat typical practice, you know, psychotherapy practice, uh, probably for most of us, uh, when we look at our patients, we can see that they had regulatory disorders. Uh, they were either depressed, which is a regulatory disorder, or they were anxiety ridden, which is a regulatory disorder, uh, or they were all over the place. Uh, which is a regulatory disorder. So, um, yeah, regulation is at the heart of the matter. Okay. And, and how does attachment theory come into play with regulation? Uh, well, um, it turns out that um, the way, so we have two ways to keep ourselves in regulated states. 
one of them is we just do it automatically. You know, and we're not going around all day thinking, stay regulated, stay regulated. We just have systems that keep ourselves in regulated states. Um, and when we become stressed, staying regulated is more difficult. But nevertheless, the automatic system usually handles it, right? There's a secondary system uh, that develops later. That, that uh, I'm getting, I haven't lost your question about why attachment theory matters here. Um, and um, um, the, uh, there's a secondary system where we sort of do it deliberately, deliberately or we do it with another person and we calm ourselves down or keep, in, keep ourselves in regulated states um, uh, in that way. Um, both of those systems, this ability to sort of interact with another person in a way that uh, keeps us in regulated states, makes us, brings us back into a regulated state or our capacity to do it by ourselves, they both form in the early attachment relationship. The, the automatic piece of that forms in the first 18 months of that early caretaker child relationship. That's when, that's when the neurological systems that do that stuff automatically, that's when they wire up. And uh, so the way that early relationship goes, uh, that's where we sort of, well, let's maybe put it differently those two person processes that went on between the go on between the infant and the caretaker, they become internalized as one person processes, they become inscribed as um, procedural memories, you know, the memories of sort of how to do things. And um, uh, so that's where we develop that in that early attachment relationship. Um, and the sort of way we do this with another person also develops in that early attachment relationship. So that early attachment relationship is fundamental. Uh, surprise to nobody, right? I mean, we, it's, it's uh, very clear in a million ways that the um, attachment um, is, uh, uh, provides us with our most powerful understanding of our development. But, um, uh, most of that is looked at sort of later. It's this first 18 months that at the neurological level, that's what matters most. That's what lays the foundation for the rest of life. Yes, thank you very much. Wes, uh, somebody in the public has asked um, how to work with adults who, who seem to have had some dysregulated um, attachment relationship as they were growing up and there are adults and how, how, how does this theory can help clinicians understand their treatments. And so to work with adults who have regulatory processes probably coming from insecure attachment or, or, or something like you know, yeah. disorganized attachments. So, so, that's, so that's a question that, uh, you know, uh, goes on forever. Um, uh, I mean, how does regulation theory or affect regulation theory help us clinically? Uh, that's sort of what the whole book's about. Uh, it, it one with the, what we were just talking about, it, it, it tells us how this stuff develops. And when we understand how it develops, that has a lot to offer us about how we can um, make changes in those systems therapeutically, right? sort of if you know how something develops, then that should inform a lot uh, about the way you work with patients in order to develop things that they haven't developed, right? The, uh, uh, um, if these systems are deficient, if the affect regulating systems are deficient, uh, the, the focus of the treatment has to be on repairing uh, or building up uh, these regulatory capacities that didn't form early. So it, the, the theory has a lot to tell us about development, which is sort of interesting, of course. Uh, and it has to tell us a lot about um, 
uh, how these disorders uh, formed or failed, or, or they were either deficits or there's some kind of a malformation of the system. Uh, and hopefully they have a lot to tell us about therapeutic action and how we can um, uh, work with patients as adults uh, in, in, in ways that are helpful uh, to these uh, deficient capacities in regulating affect. Thank you. It, it, I should, let, let me add one more thing too. Please it's do. very important for assessment. And just to sort of give you a very sort of uh, uh, brief thing, you can sort of look at somebody's capacity to regulate affect um, in, a, in, 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 in sort of simple ways. One is um, how, how frequently do they become dysregulated? Uh, another is, um, uh, how intense is that dysregulation? Uh, another is, what form does that regulation take? Do they get into very low states of arousal? Or are they anxious and, you know, up at high levels? That tells you a lot. Uh, and then the third is, what if when they get into regulated, dysregulated states, how long does it take them to get back into regulated states? Yes, yes. That tells you an enormous amount about the resiliency and about their capacity to stay in regulated states. We all get dysregulated, you know, mm -hmm. on a daily basis. It's really a question of uh, how quickly we can we get back into regulated states. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think you, you touch on this subject in depth in the lectures in the seminar. So yeah, yeah, that's very good that, that, that we're discussing this. And I have a, um, one, two questions. Um, so a uh, person, Raha Miriam asks, when attachment goes wrong and regulatory capacity does not form and leads to dissociation and in therapy, working with highly dysregulated clients with multiple dissociated self states how does this affect treatment? That's um, the question. Okay. Uh, well, um, if somebody, uh, 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 you know, the word dissociation is uh, sort of problematic because it really refers to two different things. Uh, this has only recently come out in the uh, uh, in the literature, past ten years, maybe. Oops, sorry about that. Um, but um, uh, there's sort of so this person uses the language of self states. Um, uh, the, if if you're talking about self states, you're talking about a dysregulation of structures, sort of later developing structures, um, where it's it's sort of like a compartmentalization. This self state doesn't know about that self state that doesn't know about this other self state. Maybe this self state knows about two of these self states, but not a third, and so on. So you've got really these compartmentalizations of the personality uh, instead of an integrated personality. You've got dissociated self states, right? There's another kind of dissociation uh, that is more primitive than that. And that is a dissociation that goes on at the neurological level. And that's dissociation when we get into what are called dissociated states. You can see that this language needs to be improved here because we're using the same word to refer to a couple of different things. But when we get into dissociated states, not self states, dissociated states of consciousness, when you know we can't think clearly and where something's off, or maybe we're uh, very detached, overly detached, or overly immersed in experience. We're in these states where our state of consciousness is no longer in our control and uh, where we, we can't really think clearly or fully. So that's dissociation at the neurological level where our states of consciousness are being affected and or where our clarity of consciousness, let me put it that way, is being affected, right? So. Um, uh, if I am uh, working with, and, and that, those altered states of consciousness, those uh, uh, disordered states of consciousness, those occur when we're dysregulated. 
So if I'm working with somebody that is suffering from those kinds of problems, I'm going directly after the regulatory mechanisms at a very fundamental level because they're having difficulty at this very fundamental level. If somebody's got problems with dissociated self state, where their personality is sort of split up and is dissociated, you know, they've got these sort of sub personalities going on that don't really know much about each other, that, you know, don't fit with each other. Um, if I'm working with somebody at that level, I'm, I'm working at a higher level, right? I'm th there now I'm talking to them about these different self states. And it's a much more cognitive, top down kind of treatment. In the other one, the therapeutic action is down at the lower level, sort of at the, at the more somatic level. It's a more bottom up kind of treatment. This so, makes so much sense. Yeah. This is, makes so much sense to have this integration of um, top down, bottom up approaches. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I have more questions for you from the public. Uh, there's somebody asking if you're um, acquainted with Mark Solm's groundbreaking work. I uh, the, the uh, Hidden Springs. Say that again. The Hidden Spring, Mark Solm's groundbreaking. I do Mark Solm's work. Yes, I do. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I would not say I'm expert in it, uh, but I I know I know what he's doing. I've heard he's he's in New York. I've heard him speak many times. Uh, uh, I read his first book. Um, I have a lot of respect for him. Uh, although um, he's looking at this in many ways differently than this. He's, he's still, I think, more interested in a one-person psychology. One-person psychology. Mm -hmm. One-person psychology, yeah. And um, uh, this work is much more involved with a two-person relational approach to psychotherapy. Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, well, Psalms is more out of a more traditional uh, orientation. He, 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 he translated uh, Freud's uh, text. And he's, he's quite an extraordinary guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great so, speaker. Great, thank you. I want to ask about the difference between one person psychotherapy and the two person psychotherapy. How does this play in the affect regulation theory model? Yeah, well, I would say the affect regulation theory is most fundamentally a two person, but it involves a one person psychology as well. It really is a mixture of both. Um, the, the, the two person model, for example, I'll give you an example of how it plays out. The two person model plays out because we sort of have two ways to keep ourselves in regulated states. We can auto-regulate, where we do it all by ourselves, or we can do it dyadically, which is the way we started out being able to do it when we were infants. And uh, that's a, a sort of a two-person uh, psychology gets set up here, right? So um, uh, um, we all have sort of a one-person thing going on and a two-person thing going on when it comes to affect regulation. And this treatment is really aimed at uh, uh, looking at both of them. And, and, and by the way, um, uh, most of our patients, you'll find uh, lean heavily, uh, our insecure patients anyway, they lean very heavily towards one kind of affect regulation or the other. Some gravitates heavily towards autoregulation and some gravitate heavily towards dyadic regulation. Some people really have difficulty put, getting themselves back into regulated states or staying regulated all by themselves. They need to talk to somebody, right? Mm -hmm. Other people, when they get stressed and get dysregulated, go off by themselves, you know, and to don't tell anybody what's going on. Just try and calm themselves by themselves. Yes, so we need to divide it up. Yes, uh, yes. These insecure patients, they get sort of divided up like this. Sure, sure. So you help both to balance whatever extreme they are, they that may be. Be one of the goals of treatment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And what also the therapist plays a role here in implicating it's him or herself in, in the process, right? Yeah. Uh, of of exactly. being part of this 
dance of regulation, this regulation yeah, together yeah. with the client. It, it, it's going to ultimately be our relationship with the patient that is the curative factor. Yeah, beautifully not, said. Not, the, 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 uh, the strongest therapeutic actions are not um, interpretations or observations or things like that. They're helpful, of course. Yeah. But the real therapeutic action for this stuff is more experiential, less cognitive. Yes. So we have a question from Sweden, from Christina Lindstrand. If you have a secure attachment from early years, but you but experience a life-threatening trauma later in life, can that start problems with regulation and a lot of anxiety? And does it take away the secure attachment you, you had from early years? That's a, a, a really good question. Uh, and the answer to it, it it's, it's a couple parts. Um, but the answer to the first part is can later in life, uh, I'm talking about this model that is primarily focused on the early trauma that goes on in the first 18 months due to failures of attunement between the caretaker and the infant. Um, now let's say you've got a secure attachment, which is what uh, um, uh, Ms. Lindstrom, was it? Yeah. Yeah. So, so. Uh, 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 says, uh, was asking about, is when you have a trauma later in life, can that cause regulatory problems? Definitely, right? Uh, uh, trauma in later life, affects the brain, just like trauma in early life. But the, 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 and, the, and the, the good news is that if you've got a secure attachment, your prognosis for being able to resolve and uh, deal with subsequent trauma is much better than if you did not have a secure attachment. If you have a secure attachment, you develop pretty good regulatory capacities. And that is worth its weight in gold when you're dealing with subsequent trauma, right? Um, if you don't have that early secure foundation for regulating affect, then you're actually more vulnerable to trauma. Yes. If you do run into trauma, it's more likely to turn into PSD if you have had early relational trauma. Thank you. And Charity, M. Cohn asks, um, I would like to get inputs on the differences or parallels between resilience and regulation dysregulation. I couldn't understand that question. Yeah, the, <clears throat> I would like to get input on the differences between resilience and regulation dysregulation. Well, um... Uh, 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 resilience is a, uh, um, how to explain this? Well, let me, let, let, me, let me explain what resilience looks like from an affect regulation point of view. So we are, you know, have this sort of zone where we're regulated, you know, we might go up and get tense, but stay regulated, or we might come down and get really sad, but stay regulated, right? Um, but then we've got these thresholds. We go over the threshold, either hyper aroused over the threshold or hypo aroused under the, you know, the, uh, at the lower threshold, and we go down it. Now all of a sudden you're depressed and you're, you know, you're not functioning very well, or you're sort of overly anxious, and you're also not functioning very well, right? So in both guys, I talked about this a little bit before. So now the name of the game is get back into a regulated state. And from the point of view of affect regulation, resilience is the capacity to efficiently return to a regulated state after you have become dysregulated. And that's its understanding of what emotional resilience is. It's the capacity to return to regulated states after having become dysregulated. Perfect. Thank you very much. Yeah. Judy Schneier wants to ask, I always wonder how we can distinguish what's due to early attachment experience and what's genetic inheritance. 
attachment theory seems to overshadow the nature in the nature nurture balance. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, uh, there's, I don't, there, there's no, it, and, and I don't think, by the way, the literature is so guilty about this. I think the profession is guilty of this. Um, it's completely clear that people come into the world with a temperament and that that has, you know, th there are environmental slash prenatal effects on the infant that can affect that temperament. But there is a heavy genetic load as well that can affect that. So that's just sort of out of the box. Then on top of that, you've got experiences that are now occurring while this sort of, let's re just refer to the early developing automatic system, right? Um, uh, when that's wiring up, the experiences you're having are gonna have an enormous effect on how that system wires up, right? But there's also genes that are getting expressed and depending on what the experiences are, getting, sorry, genes that are, that are dependent on certain kinds of experiences for getting expressed. So you have what's called an epigenetic effect. And, and actually, I think nowadays, the old nature nurture controversy is sort of done with because it's completely established now that uh, in, in a field called epigenetics, uh, epigenetics that it's uh, always an interaction between the environment and the expression of the genes. Is so. Rachel Yehuda's work, is Rachel Yehuda doing some yeah. kind of research around epigenetics? There's a ton of them. A ton of them, yeah. yeah. Thank you. So we have Arnon Rolnik. He's asking, can affect regulation or happen or occur in distant uh, therapy, like online Zoom psychotherapy? Well, all the top-down stuff, I think, can for sure. The bottom-up stuff, I think, you know, I, let, let, let me put this differently. Um, uh, I, I, I have a brother who's a real nerd and who turned me onto the internet very early on. And um, um, so this is back in the late 80s, early 90s. And there were already people back then who were talking about doing psychotherapy online. And there was a lot of discussion that went on about that. And I took a strong position of forget it. There is so much loss that, um, the, 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 the really important parts of psychotherapy, other than just the purely cognitive stuff, that none of the emotional stuff was gonna be able to happen online. Now that was before there was video, it was before there was even color, it was mostly text and uh, very few images. Uh, but still, you know, I, 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 until the pandemic, I think I was still of the school that there is a lot lost online. Now that I've been doing this for a year online, I'm pleased at the extent to which this can work online. I'm also aware of the, some, of the fact that something feels different in an in-person relationship and in a video mediated relationship. Um, uh, uh, it, it's, it's a little like shaking hands with gloves on. It doesn't have the same feel. And it's, somehow it's not quite as intimate. It's not, there's, doesn't feel the same. And I, there's something like that, that is missing. And I don't know how important that is, you know? Um, I, I should say something else. I think it's dyad specific. I think with some patients, they can't wait to get back to the office and I can't wait back to be back in person treatment with them. With other patients, uh, they're, it, it, they know the difference. Don't get me wrong. They all can feel the difference. They're all, but uh, some of them are like, this is going okay. And if I can save myself an hour commute each way, I'm happy with that. So, um, uh, 
So we'll see. It, 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 as you can probably tell, I don't have the answer to this question. Yes, uh, yes. And, um, uh, but I think it's an important question. Although, uh, uh, as I say, I, 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 I'm, I'm pleased at the extent to which this can work, um, to which you know, Zoom can work uh, for affect regulation therapy. Yeah, that, that I just wanted to add, there is some research on the new, on recent research on eye movement in the camera on some sessions. And then Deb Dana has worked on this on her learning labs, uh, uh, creating, um, uh, facilitating um, the dialogue between, okay, what's in the context of, of this new reality of, you know, meeting in different spaces with the clients in different situations and exploring uh, the objects, the place, and creating that shared dialogue or even part of the session. But it's, uh, there, there are quite a few articles around this, but um, oh, I, I hope I will share the links or something with the yeah, people great. later on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So we'll continue with our questions. We have um, Carmen Lagos asking, what do you refer to with uh, regulatory mechanisms? Can you uh, give an example? Uh, well, um, regulatory mechanisms, uh, as I say, fall into sort of two categories. One of them is this sort of auto regulation, uh, and the other is dyadic regulation, and there's mechanisms in both of them. Um, the, the automatic uh, stuff, which is uh, uh, auto regulatory. Um, the auto regulatory has both automatic and deliberate, right? So uh, the automatic stuff is all at the neurological level. This is going on in the, what's well, called, uh, uh, if you take the course, there'll be uh, uh, a, uh, a chapter on this, you know, about what the neurobiological um, underpinning of this stuff is, and it's going on at the neurological level. And that is the limbic autonomic system. That's the system that puts us in hyperarousal or hypoarousal and does it with this sort of very fast automatic responding to objects out there in the world. And it will go up or down in response to the objects, all right? So that's, that's that system. Um, and then there is just the, you know, our sort of relational moves with other people, uh, which, um, uh, you know, how much contact, uh, how much eye contact are we having? How good are we uh, at reading what's going on in them? Uh, how open are we with them? Um, can, can we uh, um, uh, talk uh, authentically with other people? Um, uh, are we too ashamed of our problems to be able to in any way interact with other people about them uh, and uh, get whatever help they can be with us? So these are all sort of the mechanisms. Some of these mechanisms are quite conscious and some of them are unconscious. Yeah. So okay. if that answers your question a little bit. I think so. Um, so I have a question from Alexandra Chacon in, and she asks, uh, can you say something about sensory motor approaches when the person is severely dysregulated and, and therefore being outside of their own window of tolerance? Uh, I can say uh, something about it as somebody who uh, has not been trained in it. Um, I'm good friends with Pat Ogden, who's the founder of that model. Uh, and I'm a fan of sensory motor therapy. It's also uh, uh, very similar to uh, uh, somatic experiencing. And um, uh, I wish that I were trained in it so that I could use it in psychotherapy as well. Uh, I think it has an enormously important contribution to make to uh, this. And it is essentially, you know, focusing people on their on their bodies, on their somatic experience in, in order to help them uh, perceive and then deal with uh, dissociated affect, you know, un unconscious affect. Right, right. So, 
uh, anyway, I'm a fan and. Uh, Excellent work, yes. <clears throat> we have more questions by Nancy Wolf. What would you say about affect dysregulation and addiction? For instance, turning to substance or behavior to regulate. Yeah. Um, uh, there's, there's like a ton to say about it. <laughs> uh, it, it, it in my understanding of addiction, um, and I'm not an addiction specialist, and there, there is a book um, that uses regulation theory. Um, damn it, I can't remember the name of it right now. But in any case, um, um, uh, addiction is a regulatory disorder, as I see it. I mean, people are using substances in order to keep themselves in regulated states uh, in most cases. Certainly, uh, um, I don't know about, uh, um, I, I would say all addictions are ultimately regulatory disorders. And I think people start to abuse substances even before they're addicted to them. Uh, they start to abuse substances because they're seeking uh, to change their emotional states that they're unable to do by themselves, which always means they're in negative emotional states and they want to put themselves in positive emotional states. Um, and they're, or they're in dysregulated states and they want to bring themselves back into a regulated state. So I, I, I think this understanding of uh, the way we work is crucial uh, for uh, understanding addiction, and I'm sure for treating addiction as well. Thank you. Yeah. Are you up for a few more questions? Yes. Yeah. So we have. Um, can uh, somebody in the in the group? Can the two different types of affect regulation be distilled in either self regulation or co regulation? I think you answered that already. But um, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. That, 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 that's exactly what they are. There is. You called it co-regulation. I call it dyadic regulation, but it's co-regulation. We're all we're always regulating each other. Every second we're talking with each other, we are regulating each other, and it's basically happening through, um, and not so much through the words we say, but through uh, the emotional communications we're making that are all going on non-verbally in our face, in our bodies, uh, and gestures, and in our tone of voice, in our pros the prosody of our voice. So we're always regulating each other in this sort of way, this sort of stream of nonverbal communication that's going on between the two of us, uh, to myself and others. Um, uh, or there is this sort of, you know, uh, auto-regulation and, and, and that does sum it up, yeah. So it takes some practice for, for clinicians to observe their own cues of their own nervous system as they come in contact with the nervous system of the client. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And this yeah. would be core regulation. Yeah. And you can also use it, you know, we, 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 you, you, we're, we're always monitoring our bodily states, our somatic states, um, because very often they have a lot to tell us about our patients' uh, emotional states or internal states. You know, that the, we, we're, we're like, I, I, sometimes I think we're like tuning you know, vibrating in relationship to one another. And um, the, the vibe that we get from another person tells us a lot about what they're experiencing, you know, so. Anyway. Yes, yes. So we have a question by Stephen Pat. What are the therapeutic strategies by which you attempt to build or rebuild regulatory capacity? I would say walk up to the course, <laughs> but <laughs> you learn either you have a broad uh, explanatory lectures there. But, yeah. uh, can you respond I mean, to him? I, I, let me just say it, it, it's true. It's like a, a, it's it's a bad question, but, um, <laughs> um, but let me just say something too. Um, uh, we're always, we, we're always uh, um, helping our pay. We've always, always, been helping our patients with their um, regulatory capacities, right? Any warm, trusting, nurturant relationship, which is the kind of relationships that we establish with our patients, is regulatory. You know, it 
enables people to talk about things that they couldn't talk about otherwise because the emotions were too distressing to them. Once we establish a therapeutic alliance with them that is trusting, uh, where we're not gonna judge them or shame them in any way, uh, where we are really listening in this sort of deeply receptive way, uh, that stuff is intrinsically regulated. And so we're regulating our patients all the time. And that experience of us regulating to them gets internalized and has a huge effect on them. Great, yeah. great. So I have a question from Silvina Loyacono. In psychotherapy perform with parents, mothers and fathers. Um, during first child, first infancy of their kids, I suppose, how to focalize the, the, the parents in relationship to regulating with difficult situations with their very young kids. Yeah. So what's the question? Uh, how would you help the parents uh, learn about how to uh, deal with, uh, with their young children who are dysregulated or who become easily dysregulated with tantrums or if I understand the question correctly because I'm translating it. Uh -huh. So let me see if I understand the question uh, uh, well enough. Um, it's just helping parents. With, yeah, what, what, what do I have uh, that might be helpful to uh, patients of mine who are parents? Um, yeah. uh, there are um, therapists who are uh, treating mothers and infants. When I say mother, I mean whoever is taking sure, care of Sure, 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 sure. And um, uh, in, including men, of course. But, but uh, um, um, so there are therapists who are doing that. I have sort of generalized um, uh, ideas that I might counsel them with. Uh, but I think that if they were having really severe problems, I might talk to them. I would be more focused on why they uh, can't stay regulated with their infants. They're probably part of the problem. But if it were really a severe problem where I thought that that infant was really going to be harmed by the failures of the capacity of the parent to be regulated, I would try and get that patient to somebody who specializes and works directly with the mother and the infant. You know, there's a lot of that going on now based in Peter Fonicky's work and in Beatrice Beebe's work. Yeah. And uh, some of that stuff has been extremely successful. They're really, they're really starting to get develop uh, uh, very good and important therapies for that. Yeah. Yes. The, you, you also touch on the lectures in, in the seminar. And it's also this Daniel Siegel um, part of helping parents reflect on their own story of become, being a child, on their own story of becoming dysregulated and what would regulate them. And, in, and there's a book by Daniel Siegel that touches on this, but it's also in your seminar. In, in, in the, it's uh, Parenting from the Inside Out that Rob, Robin Brandy is uh, uh, contributing to the, us through the chat. And then passing it on to Silvina Moyakono, and there's a book of Daniel Siegel and Mary Hartzell about yeah. parenting from the inside out, but teaches yeah. uh, 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 reflection to parents. Yeah. I, I second the motion. Yes, so we have a question by Lucas Mas from Spain. So what about personality disorders? Are these based on insecure attachment? And, and yeah. Um, according to this model that I have proposed in this book, which is heavily influenced by Alan Shore and Peter Bonnegy, especially by Shore, um, uh, certainly this piece comes directly out of Alan Shore, which is that, yes, personality disorders are heavily, strongly associated and very firmly theoretically supported. Um, uh, this is very heavily supported, but the, 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 that the personality disorders, 
narcissistic disorders and borderline disorders uh, originate in insecure attachment. And you know, it's not one to one here. Don't 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 uh, take this further than it should be. But that um, uh, borderline personality disorder is um, uh, strongly associated with disorganized attachment and um, uh, narcissistic personality disorders um, come in two varieties. One of them is gets called a uh, inflated narcissist or a hyper aroused narcissist or a grandiose narcissist. Um, and they come out of one kind of insecure attachment called preoccupied attachment. The other kind of narcissistic personality, a deflated one, which is the sort of down-regulated, hypo-aroused kind of narcissistic personality, just as egocentric, but instead of this sort of grandiose, extroverted character, the more withdrawn and quiet, more, more the aloof kind of narcissist, um, distant, um, um, uh, they're more associated with the avoidant, uh, insecure attachment. Yeah. Yes. So, yeah, very good, very good question. And, and uh, very important to understand uh, because they, they it, it tells you not only about the, uh, why they're uh, upregulated or downregulated, but it also tells you about the object relations that go on alongside that, which is crucially important. Yeah, so we have a few more questions before we wrap up. And um, well, somebody already asked uh, this question, but it's closed. Let me see if we can have a variation. Maria Calatrava says, could you explain to us what you know about the best way of facilitating emotional regulation in patients whose behavior is immature? This person has difficulty link, to link with other people's or maintain their commitments. Patient, patient has said that last part of the, the The patient has a difficulty to connect with other people or co keep their commitments. Yeah. Um, this so, like an avoidant, you know, or I don't know. Uh, uh, um, could, could well be, yeah. Uh, I'm sort of loathe to, um, talk specifically about a specific patient uh, that I've never met and, and, and they're, everybody's so complicated and everybody's so idiosyncratic and everybody's so particular and peculiar mm -hmm. um, that um, uh, I, 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 I don't really like to say this is the way I would treat that particular patient or not. You know? This is a very good um, answer. This is yeah, an excellent I just, answer. Uh, just, I'm just not comfortable with it yeah yes i guess i just want to be able to discuss this with the audience and you and me so so we if i disagreement you know we cannot discuss clients in this setting yeah no i didn't because that, it's a free that, webinar that, anyway i didn't mean just because of the uh, yes, uh of privacy issue but also sure. uh that you know it's There's complicated. Yeah, but yeah. every single one that it's just. Yeah, yeah. And, so. and then, then again, I really, really encourage Maria Calatrava and anybody who wants to follow the, the seminar and the book. It's a great learning to find your own formulations on how you would deal with somebody who has this kind of problems. Yeah, so, um, and. Uh, yeah, I think, could there be a, any association between regulation problems and you know, development of personality disorders like BPD? You already answered this. Is the regulation theory, regula regulation therapy similar to dialectical behavioral therapy? Uh, Dialectical behavior therapy, as I understand it, involves uh, uh, sort of uh, comes at it from three different directions. Uh, I think it, uh, it's been a long time since I uh, knew this, but I think it comes at it from sort of a psychodynamic approach, a cognitive behavioral approach, and also sort of a mindfulness approach. 
Yes, yes. And um, um, I, 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 you know, they're working. Uh, they're, they're most famous for work and the most effective uh, for treating borderline personality disorders. It's a very highly structured treatment um, and a very intensive treatment. And I think two things. One is all that structure, I think, has to help, you know, for, for somebody as disturbed as some of the hospitalized borderline patients and suicidal patients who are most well known for treating. I know it's being extended now to other, to other disorders, but that's, you know, was its initial claim to fame. Um, and certainly mindfulness is very helpful for race, for self-regulation. Um, so I, I suspect, and I, 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 I'm no expert in DBT, but uh, I suspect doing lots of things that are helpful uh, to people with regular, that are helping people develop the capacity to uh, um, uh, tolerate stress without becoming dysregulated. Uh, and to uh, return to regulated states after they become dysregulated. Thank you very much. So I want to take the, we're coming to the end of our hour and I'm gonna remind everybody that this will, this is recorded and it will, it will be in a few days, um, probably posted on our YouTube channel of the Instituto Cuatro Ciclos. So for you to watch it, for you to listen to the questions again. And I want to invite you to join us for the seminar. If, you, if this is something you would like to deepen, it's a seminar that you will get uh, 50 um, continued professional development units from Great Britain and 44 continued education credits for American clinicians, licensed clinicians of all sorts through Cassidy seminars. And you have a 20% discount. We already created a special fee for this online course, but you will have an additional 20% discount um, um, in the, in, if you register within the next 48 hours. And you will be sent an email with the discount code for you to use. You will receive this tomorrow. So you, you have until the weekend, if you will, will like to explore this seminar uh, that has 12 lectures online, the transcripts, uh, additional uh, research material for you to, to explore, uh, quizzes, and four live, on call, live calls with, with, with Daniel Hill to respond to your questions. So we, we look forward to having you with us. The course is in English, it's in Spanish and it's in Italian. The Spanish and Italian versions, you will have access also to the English original version language and the translated videos as well. Everything is translated into Spanish in the Spanish uh, version and everything is translated into Italian in the Italian version. So I look forward to seeing you and I want to thank everybody for, for showing up today and thank you, Dan, for your time and your generosity with us. Sure. And I look forward to, to more. Thank you. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh -huh.